Hello to you all. Um, welcome to the sixth uh, session of our course on uh, Geography 112, that's um, Agriculture and Human Geography, uh, the second part. If you recall, uh, in the previous session, we dealt with uh, part one, and for this uh, session, we'll be dealing with the part two of it. My name is Dr. Isaac Arthur, and I'll take you through this uh, session. Yes, um, the session overview has not changed. If you would recollect from the previous session, it's the same. Uh, that is to, uh, for the purpose, is to introduce students or you to agricultural systems in order to understand the role of agriculture in nat uh, national development. And uh, from the previous lecture, I believe that you've really um, have had uh, good knowledge of the role of agriculture in national development. Uh, for the objective um, is to explain the key role of agriculture in national development, describe the different approaches to classifying world agriculture system, and also describe the key characteristics and dynamics of agricultural system in the world. So for this session, uh, we're going to look at uh, two main things. That's the, the agricultural system in the temperate regions. In the previous session, we dealt with the tropical regions. So for this session, we'll move to the uh, temperate region so that you get a, an overview of the different agricultural systems in the world. And then we will conclude with the agricultural system in Ghana. Ghana is not a temperate region, but then having talked about the tropical regions uh, generally, we thought that it was important for you to have a feel of uh, agricultural systems in Ghana. But I would want to emphasize that most of the things that you're going to experience or learn about Ghana is not too different from the general understanding of agricultural systems in, uh, uh, in the world. But then it's important to get specific examples. So the case of Ghana is only uh, an example. Yes, so for our readings, um, I will encourage you to read chapter 19, pages 484 uh, to 488 of the recommended text. That is English PW 1997, which is entitled Geography, People and Places in a Changing World. So, agricultural systems in the temperate regions. Um, first of all, I think it's important for us to understand what is uh, a temperate region. So, to define a temperate region as a broad region ranging from warm temperate zone or what is sometimes described as subtropical zones to cold temperate regions. So, you can see this uh, from the um, map here showing the temperate regions in the world. Yeah, for the general characteristics of agricultural systems in the cold and warm temperate Mediterranean areas, um, the following can be uh, observed uh, or, or be, be seen. That uh, developed countries mainly make up of the temperate and some extend the subtropical or Mediterranean lands. And the main features of agricultural systems are small percentage of farmers, you know, uh, are in labor force. So it means that they don't use or you don't find too many people engaging the agricultural systems over there or in agriculture over there. Uh, there are less than 5% of the population in agriculture. Uh, however, the small percentage of uh, labor force produces enough for the country and also for export. So it tells you that um, they produce on a very large scale with very uh, little number of uh, people, right? So obviously it tells you that they use a lot of machinery uh, in the agriculture. And agriculture is also seen as an economic activity. It's not just for subsistence, as we've seen in most uh, tropical countries. They actually produce for the market. And the 
cultivate crops and raise animals purposely for sale, you know, as I said earlier on, not for consumption. And the production is done on a very large scale. Farming in this region is characterized by high uh, uh, reliance on technology and scientific improvement. You know, because they have the resource, the financial resources, they're able to engage in a lot of agricultural research and development activities, and this helps in their yields. And farming is integrated with other related businesses, especially for the food processing industry, packaging, storing, distribution, retailing uh, of food. And you can see this uh, among those engaging large-scale and even small-scale uh, food uh, production. And you can see an example uh, from these uh, pictures here. As you can see, uh, this couple, a uh, man and his wife, actually owns a, a farm in the northern part of Denmark. And they just don't depend on their farm. But then they have introduced a farm shop. And what they do is that they process some of their farm products and then sell them on the, uh, uh, in the farm shop. And they also make sure they package some of these uh, products nicely and then sell them in the farm. And other um, interesting activity is that they also attract visitors on the farm where they can spend a weekend or some days. Visitors with families. So the, they will live in a guest house as you see here. And for example, their children can experience, uh, see these animals helping feeding the animals on the farm. And they do this for a fee, right? So the farmers or the couple do not depend only on their crops, but also the stay of uh, people on the farm. And the children also have other recreational activities, you know, to enjoy, to play around the farm. Right, so they p provide um, what people will call agrotourism, and that is uh, complemented in their uh, farming activity. Yeah, so when it comes to the types of agriculture in the temperate and subtropical regions, uh, you can have um, the popular one called uh, market gardening and fruit farming. Uh, you can also see commercial dairying. Uh, commercial grain farming, livestock ranching, and then you have the Mediterranean agriculture and mixed crop and livestock farming. So we're going to talk about some of these uh, types of uh, farming shortly. Yeah, so when it comes to market gardening, uh, in the U.S. it's popularly known as the track farming, and it's concerned with intensive um, cultivation of vegetables, fruits, and flowers, in an open land, right? and it is widely practiced in the developed world. So when we talk about the developed world, we're looking at countries like the, uh, the UK, the Germany, the Australia, the Canadas. And the market garden is one of the most intensive type of uh, crop farming with a very high value output. Right? It means that what they, it's very intensive and what they do is that they yield a lot of uh, uh, products or outputs. And the farms are generally close to urban areas. You know, it's unlike um, other forms of farming which are concentrated in the rural areas, but they are pretty close to the urban areas. Although in recent years they have seen a push, uh, or they've been pushed further away as a result of rapid urbanization, Right, so the, the, there's been some changes uh, in recent times. But the key thing here, or some of the important thing, is that some of the fresh fruits are sold to individuals, whereas most of them are sold to uh, large food processing companies for canning and freezing. Um, the character of market garden has changed in recent times. Uh, for instance, in the past, the farming system was very labor intensive. You know, that, that's, that was the days where we didn't have all the people engaging in this type of farming didn't have a lot of uh, technological advancement. The character of market gardening has changed in recent times. Uh, 
Um, and then the changes can be seen in terms of uh, decline in uh, labor intensive to more capital intensive form of production. And the key factors that have resulted to this is the expanding markets for quick frozen food, technological advances, high labor costs, increasing competition from overseas, especially from the tropical areas where labor is cheaper and natural uh, environment conditions are more favorable um, in recent times. So these factors means that um, the owners or people engaged in this form of uh, farming activity do not depend so much on uh, the labor, but rather they invest more into capital uh, in their activity. Yeah. So moving from there, the other form of farming is the dairy farming in, uh, in temperate regions. And when we talk of uh, dairy farming, it covers, uh, or the main activity there is a production of liquid milk. Um, and this is either sold in urban markets or processed uh, for sale as cream, butter, cheese, and dried uh, milk products. So you can see from the picture here, uh, you have milk, cheese, uh, butter, and this one is yogurt, which uh, uh, people use uh, or consume at home. It is also another uh, form of intensive farming system. Um, however, the level of intensity vary from factory type system. You know, usually they have a system where people will keep the animals in the store for all year round, uh, but others would also take them out to graze. So it depends on the type of system that they have. And the factory type system is common in the vicinity of large cities such as Los, uh, Los Angeles and other cities in Norway, for example. But um, you can also find similar uh, practices in Germany, in Denmark, and in the UK. Uh, the open grazing system is also common in New Zealand, um, where land holding is uh, or are about um, 617 acres. So it tells you that they also operate on a, a very large scale. These farms are often located closer to the market because the milk is a very perishable uh, commodity. So they prefer to um, locate close to the market to avoid any uh, spoilage. Uh, as a result of urban expansion, dairy farms have been pushed further away from the market, you know, just like um, a market garden, for example. However, the improvement in transportation and refrigeration has uh, permitted dairy farmers, uh, farms to be located further away from um, the urban areas because these, um, for example, the refrigerators can preserve the milk for a long time. But um, interestingly, the farther away of the farms from the market, the lower the proportion of output devoted for milk. So what this means is that some of these farmers emphasize or are very concerned about quality of their products. So even though with, uh, they can keep these, uh, the milk in the refrigerator, they think that um, the quality may be uh, affected after a while. So what they do now is to turn these uh, milk into cheese, uh, into butter, uh, or even uh, dried and condensed milk when they are far away from the market areas. Another form of uh, a cultural system or farming type in the temperate region is uh, commercial grain farming. And the dominant uh, grain farming in this part of the world is wheat production. It is cultivated under a variety of fiscal conditions and under both intensive and extensive systems. And if you go back, we've already discussed intensive and extensive systems, so you can uh, relate this type of production to that. One reason why we Wheat is grown under a variety of fiscal environments. The fact that there is high demand of it as a staple food. You know, wheat is usually turned into bread. And in that part of the world, 
they make different kinds of bread. You know, they also use in the production of other foods, like for example, pizza. You know, so uh, the demand for wheat is always, uh, from generations to generations, has been high. Another reason is the fact that there are many kinds of wheat, each tolerating different environmental conditions. You know, there are some wheats that are grown in the winter. There are also wheats that are uh, uh, grown during the spring. So, you know, you can see it from there. So important regions for the production of wheat are Russia, the US, and Canada. They produce a significant amount of wheat for, the, uh, for production in the world. Now, having uh, finished with the um, agricultural system in the temperate region, we'll move straight to agricultural systems in Ghana, as uh, I promised you earlier. So you can see on the slide the map of Ghana and then some agricultural activities. Now, so we're going to move into the specifics. Um, generally, the characteristics of our cultural system is that there is predominance of food farming and about 62% of farmers are food farmers operating largely on subsistence or on a small scale uh, level. Um, it is also predominantly uh, rain fed, which means that they depend a lot on the rain. So in times where we, we record low levels of rainfall, it obviously affects uh, cultural production in the country. Um, it is also constrained by low crop yield and output due to factors such as low application of irrigation. In there are areas where the irrigation facilities are bad or not uh, in existence, and people are not able to uh, apply them uh, correctly. There's also low soil fertility in some areas, lack of access to credit. You know, most of these farmers are poor and therefore cannot afford to buy certain um, inputs, agricultural inputs, and it's all because they can't get access to credits. The banks will not give them any loans because they don't know they don't they do not have the collateral, you know, uh, with which they can uh, access loans. Um, we also have uh, inadequate or poor infrastructure which will support agriculture. That is, uh, for example, poor road networks, for example. Uh, high post harvest losses, and this can also be linked with the bad roads, because when the roads are bad, the products stay on the farm for a very long time and do not reach the farms early enough uh, for consumption or purchase. And we also have limited access to market centers which is also uh, related to the uh, port road networks. So the post-harvest uh, losses are pretty high in, in this country. Another activity is low productivity in an, uh, animal rearing and low resistant breeds of livestock and high instance of animal diseases. Right? Um, we kind of introduce different uh, breeds of livestock, you know, some of them are imported from outside, but when they come in, they do not uh, survive, you know. So it brings about uh, a lot of uh, loss to the farmers. Other problem is also the climate change. You know, there are drought situations, there are situations where uh, there's, there, there's too much rain in the area, so uh, it affects our cultural production. So climate change, um, it's um, a big uh, thing. And beside that, the environmental degradation, people have cut down trees, and this does not uh, augur well or help in uh, making uh, the soils fertile. So this tends to affect uh, cultural production in many areas of the country. Now, with livestock agriculture, it's common in every village in Ghana, but uh, by far most important are cattle. You know, there are a lot of cattle uh, railways in the uh, communities. And the main centers for cattle production are the interior wounded savanna, um, 
the Accra Plains and the whole Keta Plains. So when you go to these areas, you find a lot of cattle uh, production activities there. In the coastal savannah areas, cattle raising is a commercial business, you know, in that people actually depend on this uh, uh, cattle for their livelihood, and they sell them on a large scale. Um, the Accra Plains also provide cattle for slaughter all the time. You know, all year round, they are able to supply uh, cattle to consumers in that area. But then there are a number of problems that are associated with uh, cattle production, especially in the northern part of the country. They lack drinking water during the dry season. Besides that, there's also shortage of feed in the dry season when no forage uh, uh, grows. Um, there's also overstocking due to emphasis placed on the number and not quality. In the advanced country, the emphasis is on quality. So they make sure that uh, through research and development and a lot of investment, you know, the animals or the cattle that are produced there are of high quality. But then it's the reverse um, in this part of uh, the world and specifically on Ghana. This leads uh, to uh, overgrazing and hence soil erosion because they, these farmers um, or these animals will depend on the few vegetations that are available and in the end uh, the, it ends up destroying the, uh, the soils that are available there. And they also have problems with diseases and pests in, that, uh, in, in these areas. So many of these animals end up dying and this also means an economic loss to the owners. Moving from there, we will touch on the bush fallow system in Ghana. And there's a system of rotation of fields or crops or bush. And I think we've learned this generally. Uh, the farmers abandon a plot of land to another after it has been cultivated for a number of uh, seasons and allowed to revert to secondary vegetation. And the length of fallow periods vary from place to place, you know. So it takes many years in sparsely settled areas and shorter time in densely settled areas. Other key factors of bush fallow system is that the size of the farms are uh, very small. And we all know the reason, because most of these farmers are poor and cannot uh, purchase uh, very uh, large um, fields you know for production and the farming is done with simple implements or simple farm tools such as the hoe and cutlass as compared to elsewhere where they would use more uh, mechanized forms of uh, inputs like the combined harvester the tractors and the likes and the vegetation is cut bent except some big trees that are left sanded you know so um, this is a, a common characteristic or, or, or feature. And sowing begins with the first rains, and several types of uh, crops are grown together on the same farm. So they practice this form of mixed uh, farming um, system there. And the fallow period has been shortened due to increased demand for land resulting from population increase. So it tells you that population is actually a feature. You know, there's always a competition of space between human beings and land for agriculture. And this can be described as ubiquitous. You know, we've seen that in the advanced countries where uh, most lands, people, certain uh, activities like market garden, uh, dairy production have been uh, moved away from the urban areas to uh, places uh, far away. And we are seeing the same thing here. Um, this, in, in our case, in, in the case of Ghana, this has resulted in low crop yield, you know, because they don't have uh, the land available, you know, enough land available for production. Um, we also have the intensive agricultural system here, 
and this can be seen in two types that is the compound farming and the unlocator system so we're going to touch on these uh, two um, for the compound farming system it is mostly developed form in the densely settled areas particularly in the north uh, east and northwestern part of ghana and how does it take uh, what form does it take or what are the main characteristics of these uh, this form of farming the land around individual compound house is manured with household refuse and animal droppings and usually the specific animal is the fowl you know they can use goats and sheep but then the predominant one is the fowl and members of the household cultivate the land intensively for their staple crops such as millet guinea corn and vegetables for their daily consumption and the average size of compound is less than an acre so it also tells you that they do this on a very small scale and it's largely subsistence with the analog keta system it is practiced by the shallot farmers on the narrow strip of sandy land between keta lagoon and the sea right and the three uh, the, the three crops are raised annually on the same piece of land the key uh, characteristic of this form uh, of farming includes uh, the intensive manuring of the soil with animal droppings and growing leguminous plants such as beans on the shallow beds after harvest uh, the leguminous plants when plowed into the soil add much needed uh, nitrogen compounds to it so uh, you can see that these people although may not apply may, may not be applying a high technological approach but then they have certain skills in which helps them um, to operate or do their farming activities they also use fertilizers actively uh, in recent times and the shallow beds are irrigated with water from shallow wells sunk uh, in several places on the shallow farms uh, planting is done by hand and the seed shallows are planted 10 to 15 centimeters apart you know um, this when you compare to the advanced economies uh, they would probably use machines but here it is uh, planted by hands and growing season is uh, uh, takes uh, about two months long right and this also explains uh, this also can be explained uh, by the fact that this is done by human beings and not machines so that's why it takes a long time harvesting is also by hand and that's after 60 days of sowing or you can say uh, two months and the shallows are dried in the sun for about a week before marketing so you can see some of these shallows marketed uh, being sold on the market having moved from there we, we will look at plantation agriculture in Ghana um, the types of plantation crops are cocoa which is one of the leading uh, products or crops that uh, Ghana produce um, we are the second uh, leading producers of cocoa in the world so it tells you that it is pretty large in the country palm oil, coffee, rubber, bananas, uh, sugarcane, and tobacco, among others, form part of the uh, plantation agriculture in Ghana. These crops are produced and sold within local and international markets, uh, especially uh, cocoa, uh, coffee, and palm oil, you know, find uh, their place uh, largely in the international market. They are mostly grown by local farmers, but increasingly by large-scale commercial farmers, um, including some owned by expatriate uh, farmers. Palm oil offers one of the best examples of plantation uh, agriculture in the country. Um, oil palm was cultivated by peasant farmers uh, in areas in the immediate hinterlands of the coast in the late 19th century generally for export so it tells you that uh, the production of uh, oil plantation 
you know, came to the rise during the colonial era because that was when the colonial administration or the colonial masters needed most of these products for their factories. You know, oil palm can be turned to so many products like uh, butter, uh, soap, as well as um, other oily uh, foods. You know, so all these were processed in their factories. Attempts to cultivate oil palm on plantation before independence were not uh, very uh, successful. That's by the local people. In the period immediately after independence, the state established large oil palm plantations um, with areas in the eastern, central, and western regions as uh, principal producers. And that's according to um, Edwin Jesse of the Geography Department. Some state farms were not very successful. Uh, since the middle of the 1970s, with the government encouragement, several thousands of uh, hectares, or we can say acres of land, have been developed into oil palm along modern lines through the nucleus estate system. Right? So you go to places like Samaraboy in the western region, you can find uh, some of these uh, plantations. Examples are the Ghana Oil Development um, Company estate around Kwai Chufu Oil Palm Plantation, which is around Chufu Praso. In terms of characteristics of um, oil palm production in Ghana, um, there's this large incorporate uh, administrative buildings, uh, living quarters, roads, uh, large um, capacity processing plants, and other modern agri-support infrastructure. What this means is that the whole area or estate it becomes a community on its own. So they provide all these uh, facilities to enhance the movement of people and also for people to enjoy all these uh, facilities, uh, both for the farm itself and the people who are actually working there. Um, they also get uh, credit you know, from the banks. They get technical advice and other essential agri support by plantation companies nearby right, uh, to small contact farmers to enable them to grow and sell um, to the company the same industrial crop grown by the companies. So what this means is that he enjoys what the economists will describe as economies of scale, you know, through such interdependencies. Um, the purchasing of crop from other nearby independent sources by uh, company for processing is also very common in that uh, areas, or in these uh, areas of um, oil palm production. So when we talk about the advantages, uh, there are a number of them the advantages of oil palm plantation. It facilitates foreign technology and capital imports. Because sometimes the people who buy them, you know, from abroad, would want to have the palm oil produced in a particular way, right? So they would uh, bring in certain technologies which would enhance uh, or to ensure that the products are produced in the way that they want. So th these are some of the benefits that they get. At the same time, they get capital from uh, the products when they are exported. They also provide essential modern agri-support services, including marketing outlets for small farmers. And the other is to ensure raw materials for central processing plants. So you can take Unilever as an example, where they process the palm oil to produce some of their products. The uh, disadvantage of oil plantation is that the system's uh, monocultural character, you know, has a disadvantage of destabilizing the natural ecosystem, you know, in terms of uh, over uh, the overuse of the soil, you know, and rendering the traditional uh, agrarian system less secure. Because if you're going to focus uh, too much attention on one particular crop, then the question is, what happens to the other crops? So this makes their cultural systems uh, very insecure. You also destabilize the businesses of other farmers, because it's not everybody who can engage in a particular crop, like uh, 
oil palm others are in interested in let's say okra production garden x production so the question is what happens to these uh producers yeah so having said that i have this sample question um which is compare and contrast agricultural systems in ghana and any temperate country of your choice you know we have studied the agricultural systems in a temperate and the tropical world we've seen uh, the Ghanaian example so we are being asked now to compare and contrast so you can do this in your spare times or you can raise this in a, in a different uh, class uh, discussion so on this note, uh, I would like to end this lecture, and you can see the references. But uh, before we end, I would want to find out if you have some questions. Um, I wanted to ask that um, you you mentioned some of the um, system, our cultural system in both temperate and tropical region i want to know why it is such why some are only relegated to the tropical and some are relegated to the temperate regions is there a reason for that mm. yes i think the weather actually plays a major role there are certain um, products or vegetations that would not survive in a temperate region and therefore it's important to focus i mean to distinguish the two i mean show the ones that are actually predominant in the temperate regions or the ones that can survive in the temperate regions and the ones that survive in the uh, tropical areas but you, you you should also see or uh, understand that uh, some of these um, productions are also based on culture you know so we can look at uh, these uh, from these two angles but i think the environment plays a major role Okay, if there's no more questions, then uh, we bring this uh, session to a close. Thank you.